Hey, everybody. Welcome again to Wisconsin Icons. My name is Bob Dolan, and as always, I'm very grateful for your time and your interest. My title sponsor for this Wisconsin Icons video podcast is Pasternak and Zergabel, award-winning personal injury attorneys located near Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and their website is www.injurywisconsin.com. Now, recall that uh, way back at the beginning of Wisconsin Icons, I I uh, said that not every episode, not every icon was going to be a person, a man or woman, past or present. On occasion, a destination can be iconic. An event can be iconic. And that is certainly the case of today's icon. In this episode, we talk about the Wisconsin Supper Club. It is uh, much more than a place to eat, as you all know. It is a it's a vibe. It's uh, it's an experience. I have lived uh, in several states in my adult life. I've also traveled to dozens of states in my professional life. And believe me, uh, not that you can't find a supper club in another state, but it's certainly not like it is here in Wisconsin. Here, it's just part of who we are. Here, we seem to have a love affair with the supper club. And you cannot say that about any other state. Uh, we just we just have loved them for generation after generation. And uh, I wonder why. We're going to find out what it's all about from Holly DeRyder. Holly is a historian at uh, PBS. A lot of her documentaries about uh, some of the great historical events and people in our state. And she's also the documentarian of a film called Old Fashioned, the story of the Wisconsin Supper Club. And there she is. Holly, how nice it is to have you on Wisconsin Icons. I greatly appreciate your time and all the uh, all the information you're about to provide about a fascinating topic, the Wisconsin Supper Club. So thank you so much, Holly. It's good to see you. Good to see you, Bob. Thanks for having me. You know, I, I know a little bit about uh, the, the uh, how to make a documentary, not as much as you, certainly. But the one thing I do know is that often a documentarian will select a topic or an issue that has great interest to him or her. You want to find out more about this particular thing that just for whatever reason fascinates you. So I assume, Holly, that's the case with your documentary on the Wisconsin Supper Club. Just tell me how and why and where your interest and your intrigue in the Wisconsin Supper Club began. That's a really great question. I um, So I'm originally from Northeast Wisconsin, so I grew up in Wisconsin and I ended up leaving the state to go to school in Chicago. And then when I left Wisconsin, I didn't think much was going to change. We're in the flyover zone <laughs> part of our country where you just feel like there, we don't have a culture. We don't have anything to offer. And when I went to Chicago, I started to notice some things that I was missing, um, you know, that I took for granted in Wisconsin. And the supper club was one of them. And I started to realize how the supper club encapsulated a lot of Wisconsin traditions that I had questions about as you know I had left and didn't find fish fries happening year <laughs> round, yeah. round yeah. in Chicago the bars didn't have brandy so it led to a lot of questions and the supper club seemed like a great place to explore those topics because they have the fish fries they have the old-fashioned supper clubs are an interesting visual um, subject. There's neon lights, there's interesting yeah. architecture, there's unique decor, and there's unique characters inside of those buildings too. So the Supper Club always intrigued me and I wanted to do something on it when I was in college. And then I didn't have a car. So I kind of put the idea on the back burner and I lost, um, fast forward, I'm working in the industry. I lose my job in the great recession. And I was dating a guy at the time who was like, take my car, go make your film. So I um, ended up marrying the guy. So that okay, kind of well, worked. Yeah. Any guy that offers you the car, you have to seriously consider his proposal. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, um, you know, like you were saying earlier, as a filmmaker, you know, there's the films that we get to work on, that we get paid to work on. But then there's the films, there's the passion projects that you choose to really pour your heart, your energy, your time, your yeah. money yeah. into. And for me, I really decided to do the, project on supper clubs because at the time when I started my film when we started shooting it was 2009 oh. and supper clubs were not looking good when I talked to the owners they're like it's good you're making this film because we might not be here in a couple of years wow they thought they were that pessimistic oh, yes we were oh, going yeah. to supper clubs and you're at a you know four o'clock 
the clientele's there at four o'clock and it was a lot of older people. Yeah. And the young people weren't showing up yet. They were still missing um, that. But um, so we thought when we started documenting this, we thought we were documenting something that was dying, that oh. was on last legs. And, um, you know, I think there's a couple of things that kind of just came together, a perfect storm to really uh, reinvigorate people's interest and support in supper clubs, which I think is really, really important. And um, I think you have boomers who are interested in, um, you know, reliving a lot of their youths, you know, their families went to supper mm -hmm. clubs there. A lot of their youth is um, tied to memories around supper clubs as is millennials. I think millennials were also looking to connect to that, you know, going to the place where grandma and grandpa would take them to. And I think a lot of people were getting a little tired of the chain restaurant scene yeah. where it was super predictable, mm -hmm. always the same, no matter where you go. And here there's um, a supper club, which is like kind of this treasure, you know, it's like a treasure hunt. You hear of a supper club, you go on a journey to find it, and you don't know what you're going to find or who you're going to meet, but you know, it's going to be a good time and there's going to be good food. So I think the millennials and boomers, it was just the right time for them to be re-interested in um, exploring supper clubs and supporting them, which they really, really needed. When was the peak period, Holly, for popularity with the supper club? And not only when, but why that period? Why were they at their peak at, at that particular time? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's one thing that's been really hard when exploring supper club history is a lot of it hasn't been formally like preserved or documented or studied. But my personal opinion is I really do feel like it's that post-World War II era. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Their country's just really booming in a lot of ways, but um, especially restaurants. When I was researching supper clubs, a lot of it depended on buying old books you'd find on eBay, like travel books based on for Wisconsin or different counties across the state. And I cannot tell you the amount of supper clubs that would be listed. And you, you know, sometimes they would have club in their name, they would say supper club or by the description of the type of restaurant, you know, like steak, seafood, you knew like, okay, that's a supper club, but supper clubs that I can't, there's just so many, I would say like, early 60s were probably the the peak okay. for supper clubs yeah, but yeah. that's just going off of looking at old advertising and um old local tour guides tour books uh of from throughout the state of wisconsin i'm assuming holly that uh this is not exclusive to wisconsin i you know I, obviously you can go to other states and find a supper club or two i have right. But there yeah. is something about the supper club in Wisconsin that is set apart from a supper club in any other state. I don't know. We perfected it. Uh, we love it. We love the experience. I in, in the introduction to you, Holly, I called it a vibe. You know, it, it's it's more yeah. than a meal. It's a vibe. And, and uh, I don't think you find that elsewhere other than here. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And I think that's one of the first questions I asked myself when researching this like why wisconsin what is yeah. a supper club and like that vibe thing came up a lot when i was talking to other people about like how do you know it's a supper club and they're like well you just know you walk in and you just got that feeling and it's like <laughs> it what's is. that feeling yeah. Yeah. but you know this was a dining trend that was throughout the whole, whole country and it really took hold in wisconsin and there's a lot of things and we explore a lot of these in my documentary old-fashioned um about how Wisconsin was just the perfect place for supper clubs to kind of be born out of that prohibition era mm -hmm. of, you know, Wisconsin really wasn't a super dry state. There was a lot of drinking happening out in the country. So you have a lot of people traveling out into the country into these places to dance and maybe drink. And um, after prohibition, that tradition kind of continued where those those um, roadhouses were switched to supper clubs. And it was easy for people to get out into the country because we're the dairy state. So we had a lot of paved rural roads that allowed people to easily go out in the country for those Sunday drives and explore and find different supper clubs to go and enjoy. Is there a first or do several supper clubs claim to be the first? A lot of people credit Lori's out in LA for being the first supper club. So that idea, that American format of a supper club of having, um, you know, entertainment, 
with um, dining and the food being part of that entertainment, they credit a lot to Lori's, who is a Wisconsin native who moved out to LA. Okay. So and those you can still find Lori's across the country. Unfortunately, the one in Chicago recently shut down during the pandemic, but yeah, yeah. that's where a lot of people credit that um, American style of supper club being born. What about a first here? Any idea of a first in Wisconsin? Oh, in Wisconsin? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Are, are there that's... about 50 firsts? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's yeah, really hard. Yeah, because there's some supper clubs today, some restaurants that would consider themselves a supper club that were around before the supper club was even invented. Sure. I'm thinking yeah. about the Red Circle Inn. Um, that's a restaurant now that a lot of people consider a supper club, but that was actually the oldest restaurant in Wisconsin. So that the here same, that's, that's a suburb of Milwaukee, that Red Circle Inn? Yes. Yes, yes. I've been there. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, Let's go. Remember the old. You're probably too young for this, but there was a there was a game show hosted by Dick Clark. It was a, ho a horrible show. It was called Twenty Five Thousand Dollar Pyramid, and you gave a topic, and then you kind of tried to list everything that would fit in that topic. So Holly, a, a Wisconsin Supper Club usually has what? Ooh. I mean, this, this could this list could go on. For example, I'll, I'll get you started. All the supper clubs I've ever been to, and I've been to my share, they usually have Christmas lights up all year round. <laughs> you know, that's their decor is you walk in and very simply de uh, decorated, but the Christmas lights are always flashing. Did you find that in your documentary? You know, that's a really good point. You do <laughs> see a lot of supper clubs because sometimes it's a really homey, you know, um, kind of decoration and very welcoming. And yeah, supper clubs, because they are usually darker, I do see yeah, people yeah. using some interesting lighting techniques in the supper club to give it more of that warmy glow, welcoming feeling. Um, but yeah, I, I another thing that I think is really important to supper clubs, and this isn't like a hard line because you know there's a lot of different designs, but you have a bar area and you mm -hmm. have a dining area mm -hmm. because the socializing, the having of the drinks, probably an old fashioned or maybe some other cocktails is really important to that supper club experience because this is not a fast dining experience. This is yeah. not a dine and dash. This is a, you're there for the night, you're there for the evening. So I really do like when you walk into some supper clubs, it's so clear where it's like the bar cocktail lounge is very defined and then the dining area is very defined. But then this is what makes it hard. I've been to a lot of great supper clubs where they kind of intermingle, yeah. you know, yeah. the dining area and the bar area is kind of one. So it's really hard to find to define the supper club but i also feel like the surf and turf menu the focus on the surf and turf they can be other things on the menu but there definitely is that you know a nice selection of steaks a nice selection of seafood um i already mentioned the cocktails i feel like that's a really important part and then like the owner's own spin on those things so like uh, the house specialty like what's their special dish or sometimes what i like every time you go to a supper club you know you usually get a potato with your with your meal yeah. but like what's that supper club's special potato like what are they known for yeah yeah you know, for their hash browns or are they known for their their baked potatoes so is a relish tray common oh relish it is I, yeah. this, okay so the relish tray i think is it was more common in the past a lot of supper clubs have cut them out just because of the cost you know cost and waste food is just getting more and more expensive so they're trying to cut out that waste, but then there's places like the Duck Inn, and you yeah. can order a relish tray for like a dollar twenty-five. It's just the perfect size. It comes with their homemade ranch, and I think that's a great compromise where they can still offer that relish tray, but then it's not an automatic thing, so they're avoiding that um, extra cost and waste when it's not necessary. So, what and a lot of supper clubs. I'm sorry. The, go ahead. I was going to say the salad bar replaced sure. a lot of the um, relish trays. It was just a more economical way people could just take what they wanted rather than um, automatically putting a variety of stuff on the table. So salad bar is a very popular compromise uh, to the relish tray, but I really enjoy a nice relish tray. I've got two others and tell me if you agree or disagree. One would be the impression at least that at a supper club, you get a very good meal, a, a lot of food, for a fair price. True? Oh, yeah, for yeah, sure. If you're yeah. going to a supper club, you're expecting to walk out with leftovers. Um, Lori, who I mentioned before, he was also credited with uh, inventing the doggy bag. 
So yeah. they wanted people to feel that abundance, you know, of, yeah. you know, you're welcome here. And here's, it's like when you go to someone's house and they're going to make sure you leave well-fed and, um, you know, you had enjoyed yourself. And I think that crosses over to the supper club too, that people want you to feel like you had a good time. It was, you know, and quality and um, quantity kind of often seem to go together at supper clubs. My final one, Holly, would be that they seem to be passed down from generation to generation in a family. And I wonder if that's part of the appeal. We we oh, like yeah. we like to know that this particular supper club has been in business by the same family for 60 years. That's a good, that's a reassuring thing to know. Oh yeah. And I think it's like that feeling of you're going into someone's home. You know yeah. these, yeah. you know, you know these people. I mean, it might be a supper club that you might only go to once or twice a year when you're on vacation, but you've been going there for maybe decades and decades and they know you and they remember you. It's that personal touch that you feel through the um, family ownership, through the attention to how they decorate the supper club, to how they interpret the supper club menu is that personal touch that makes each supper club a new discovery and something that people enjoy going out and exploring. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because I've often thought of a supper club as almost like a family reunion because because when i walk in you know you mentioned the bar area and yeah. often you'll sit for a drink and whoever it is that may be sitting next to you you usually strike up a conversation there's total strangers and you don't usually find that in another restaurant and then you move to your table to dine and the same thing whoever may be sitting at the table next to you there's always a very polite and often uh, entertaining conversation there. So it's almost like you're, and then the, the hosts are often, you know, either a grandma or grandpa or the, you know, the son and daughter, but it's been passed down. And it's like you're walking into an extended family. Oh yeah, completely, for sure. There's that feeling of um, welcomeness and congeniality that you just feel like you're, you might be dining there with someone else, but we're all dining together. We're all there yeah, enjoying yeah. the supper yeah. together. So yeah, I love those random interactions and connections you make at the supper club. It's I've made some lifelong friends for, at <laughs> supper clubs, just complete strangers. Yeah. I've had some really good random conversations. So it's um it's one of the things I love about the supper club. You've mentioned a few times, Holly, the old fashioned. In fact, just the title of it's uh, the head title of your documentary. Mm. What's the connection there? I mean, how that's kind of been adopted as the drink of a supper club. How, why did that happen? So old fashions just became really popular in Wisconsin. And we and the, there's no like this is something where, again, with history, don't know quite for sure. But I think uh -huh. there's a lot of things that are at play here. Um, you know, you have a a state that gets heavily populated with Germans and they prefer sweeter drinks. And then also um, you have recently it was discovered in Milwaukee. There's a woman who is researching the book, um, Wisconsin cocktails, Jeanette Hurt. And she found an article where they discovered some, a big bounty of brandy, <laughs> Christian brothers, brandy, I think, believe it was, and they needed to use it up. So people started to use it to mix drinks. So they were also thinking that's where the Wisconsin okay. brandy passion came from. Yeah. Um, she discusses that more in her book, but it's there's a lot of factors I think that were at play that kind of made um, the brandy old fashion a really popular drink here in Wisconsin. And I think the supper clubs being a place for cocktails, you know, it's not necessarily a drink you might have if you go to a bar you know, with friends, you might have a beer, but um, for those special nights of Friday night or Saturday night, you might get a cocktail and the brandy old fashioned is a great, um, a great thing to get in Wisconsin because you can really only get it here. Hmm. But there's a lot of history that gets and theories around that and how it became the drink, pretty much Wisconsin state drink. Times change, Holly. And often uh, businesses have to change along with the times. Has the Wisconsin Supper Club had to change over the last roughly, you know, 20 years, 25 years? Or is it a key or is it important to them to stay true to the past and keep that yeah. identity? It is. That is a really good point, because you often when you walk into a supper club, you feel like you've walked back a couple decades absolutely or 40 or 30 mm -hmm. and you know some supper clubs really do hold their ground um you know the white stay again their menu is the same since they opened that's it and then you have a lot of 
supper clubs who are adjusting to people's, you know, diet changes, or, you know, we have a lot more, I get a lot of requests, people wanting to know supper clubs that have good vegetarian offer uh, options. And cause you know, in the past supper clubs really haven't had a lot of that. So there, I think there's a balance of trying to keep that your core values, but then like adjust with the times, you know, yeah. some supper clubs, they would only take cash, you know, and some, you know, they finally start taking cards and so stuff like that, where I think they, you just have to kind of walk that line of what do you um, adapt to and like, what is going to keep you what you've been in your, the heart of the supper club. So Holly, we've established that it's, it's a vibe for lack of a better word, but if, if you were to, to speak with someone from another state, they had no idea what a supper club was. They had no idea what this, you know, Wisconsin thing is about a supper club. And you were trying to describe to them after all your research and after all your filming and after all your interviews, just what is a Wisconsin supper club? What do you tell them? We tell them it's a restaurant that you are going to spend the evening night at. You cannot rush. You're going to enjoy some cocktails at the bar. You're going to make some new friends. Don't be afraid to stop, talk to some strangers. And then when, when you're ready to, you can move on to the dining room where you're going to enjoy um, a large meal, probably going to be taking leftovers home. <laughs> and, and it's going to be a lot of steak and seafood, but there's other options too, if that's not what you're feeling for the night. And you know what? The evening doesn't always stop after dinner. You know, it's don't be afraid to go back to the bar and seek out that other couple that you were talking to, or if you want to talk to the bartender a little bit more. So I think the big idea to let people know is it's a welcoming place and it's a place where you need to just enjoy it. Don't, don't make other plans that night. Just plan to spend the night there. This had to be a fun project, Holly. <laughs> it was six, it was six years in the making uh, Yeah, yeah. and it was fun. The research was really fun working with the, um, the the owners of the supper club was just really great meeting everybody um but it was really you know like as you know as somebody who's made documentaries too it's really challenging finding the time to work on it finding the funding to get sure. things done sure. it's that there's a lot of blood sweat and tears and laughter that went into this project but that's why when you choose a project especially if it's a passion project you, as a filmmaker you know you got to make sure it's something you really love and this was a subject that I just felt so personally connected to. I really had a passion and interest of exploring this because it's, it speaks a lot to my, um, my own experience growing up in Wisconsin. My family, we went to supper clubs. We had our regular supper clubs we'd go to for those family celebrations, those family gatherings. So I, for me, this was a really personal project that I'm just happy that so many other people have enjoyed. Where can we see your film, Holly? How can we access it? If you go to oldfashionedthemovie.com, you can buy a DVD or do a digital download or streaming option if that's what you prefer. And then, um, sorry, my brain just went blank. Uh, yeah, so oldfashionedthemovie.com is the best way to find my film. Holly, all of a sudden, I'm very hungry. And I'm very thirsty. <laughs> oh, me too. I was going to make soup for dinner, but now I feel Yeah. Like, hey. No, no, no. That ain't going to cut it. No. <laughs> Holly, you've been a joy, and we will check out the documentary. And we certainly appreciate your time on Wisconsin Icons. Okay? You take care. You too. Thanks, Bob. <laughs>